And so we'd come like this and we'd talk and we'd say we're totally dependent on the Lord. But we, but we would drive up in a Mercedes or a Cadillac Seville to tell you this. And you know, I couldn't understand why there was a glazed look in everybody's like, eyes. Like, who are you kidding? And the Lord took every Just took single penny to the point that our house was going to go. When he gave Bob, he's always, always the Holy Spirit, no, gave me. No, it wasn't you that time. Give me nothing. <laughs> Bob kept saying to me, Bob and Liz Elaine that See, what happened? Okay, the, the terrorists, our pilgrimage ministry, which is what we really started that's with how we in started. 1983, we thought that's all he wanted overseas, of us. Was doing extremely well. So well that we opened up a travel agency, a big office, got nice desks and all this stuff, built it and, and, and did it in an $11,000 catalog. And that fall, was when, uh, well, that summer was when TWA hijacking took place, and then that fall, the Achille Loro in uh, that that boat was uh, was hijacked by terrorists, and then that Christmas, the Rome and Vienna airports, they started shooting uh, semi-automatic rifles at the people in the airports. So pilgrimages were a thing of the past. Uh, they just we would advertise. We kept nobody, advertising. Nobody would you know, answer. We'd what advertise. Else do you do? Nobody would answer. And so everything was going, and we were at a point now where we, we would not be able to make our mortgage payments. We were just, we were, the house was going, and Penny, Penny's running around, la, la, you la, know, la, you la, know, la. And, and the thing is that they never tell me anything like this unless it's the D-Day, you know? We're going down for the so last they, count. They said, you know, we well, hate to tell you this, but the house is going to go. She says, but the Lord says, you've got a treasure. And I said, I keep on praying to the Lord, and I keep hearing. Saying, you've got a treasure. You have a treasure. You have a treasure. I said, honey, would you ask him where the treasure is? Because we can't make the mortgage money. And, and that's typical. Uh, you tell me something. I never ask you the next question. Bob asked it. So I did. I, and it's always either at the time of consecration, this is the truth, or before the Blessed Sacrament. And, he, and not necessarily exposed, because in our little church, he was only exposed once a month uh, on a Wednesday. And so uh, I was praying there, and uh, well, before that, Bob said, uh, "I have to go I, back I, to our yeah, business that I, we used to have." I, we have to go back, he said. You know, we used to only uh, work maybe eight months of the year, and, and even with that, we were always evangelizing. God doesn't want us to lose the house. And I had said, I said something then that I have to tell you in all honesty, I never could have done, because I am nothing without my husband. But I said to him, I'll go on without you. But I know. Even then, as I said it, I knew I couldn't. So I went into the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, and Jesus and I had a talk. And she's crying. And I'm prostrated in front of the tabernacle. And I said to him, I gave you everything. Now do you take my marriage? Jesus doesn't do that, by the way. And in comes Bob. And Bob prostrated himself and said, where else? Shall I go? So from that moment on, we never looked back. But the house is still okay, going. So everything is going, and the big treasure that my wife gets from the Lord is write a book on the miracles of the Eucharist. Now, we had never, ever written a book. We In our did, life. <laughs> we used to sell to Christian bookstores some of our religious, we had some religious stuff. that we, And that's the extent. Of, we had never... We had never taken anybody. Or no, we had been taking people on pilgrimage, so we had that little group of, we could send mailings out to them. I said, well, first of all, we've never written a book. Second of all, who are we gonna, who's going to publish it? How are we going to sell it? How are we going to print it? And we didn't know. See, you know Bob and I deal out of ignorance. Which is really good. And this is the way we did our business, too. And, and everybody kept copying us because we never did anything like anybody else did, you know? So they, didn't know how. they thought we knew what we were doing, but we didn't. <laughs> and, and so uh, I didn't know that nobody buys first authors. So here I'm writing the book. They're keeping the bill collectors away. And, but we did have three publishers, Tan, Tr uh, Trinity, and our Sunday visit. All three of them wanted, wanted to publish, to publish the, the book. book. And the only problem we said was... Well, see, we, we really need to get some money out of this book right away because we're going out of business. Can we buy some of the books and sell them? We, we spoke to Trinity. So Trinity was the only one who was really 
He was a really, not uh, the other, the others were, but they were more business oriented and he was more spiritual was a, oriented. This a son of Mary, And he said, you really don't, you can't have, he said, send me what you need. Tell me what you need so we needs. can work this out. And so we, I sent him a listing of what we needed. And, he, and what the Lord had told us. He said, you can't have anybody publish this. He says, you can't afford to, you need the money from this. So you got to publish it yourself. We so, said, well, we, we've never published anything, so don't worry about that. Well, I'll, we don't know how to typeset. He said, I'll typeset it. I'll do the it. typesetting. I'll, I'll even give you a listing of all my bookstores. That you all his book, and, and, here's the pub, and he said, I said, well, we don't know who, any printers. I'll give you the I'll biggest, you the printer. my printer. He's the biggest in the United States. Now all we needed was $10,000. We didn't have $10,000 weeks of the eye. <laughs> and so it just happened to be that a couple came on pilgrimage with us, and they would never go up to the Eucharist. And when Bob and I would come back, and it happened in St. Anthony's Chapel. In Portugal, in, in, in Lisbon. Uh, in Lisbon, no, no, in uh, St. Anthony's in uh, Saragossa, Our Lady of Pilar. Oh, right, the, okay. Uh, we come back, and I look at these two, and they're crying. Looking up at the Lord, you could see them adoring the Lord. So Bob and I, who are very diplomatic, that night walked up to them and said, what's your problem? Why don't you go to communion? Why don't you go to communion? <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to say that, by well, the way. Well, we became very close, and, and to make a long story short, he, he was, was a Baptist. And he, and he was baptized by his father, and they were trying to get, he was trying to become a Catholic and have their marriage <laughs> blessed in the church. But he was a land developer in Louisiana who had lost $34 million. I can't even count that high. It, when, when all the oil thing happened in the, uh, what was it, in the, in the early 80s, late 70s, he was, he was unbelievably broke. And so we would they share, we would share about whose situation was worse. You know, can you taunt this? And, and he'd call up every day and he'd tell me the latest, you know, the, the IRS, the IRS, and, and, I, and I would tell him I was, you know. And so this one day I told him, I said, So we, we told him about all this stuff we said, and and so then he says to me, we need $10,000 to print the book, and where are we going to get $10,000 the book $10, is done, from? but I don't have to, never thinking a minute. And so he says, oh, I'm going to talk with Beverly Ann, and uh, we'll call you back. back. We'll call you back. The two of them get back on the phone. Now remember, something. this guy is broke. <laughs> I mean, nothing. And he said, we, we have one son who was supposed to go to college, and so we set aside a trust of $10,000 for him. He never went to college, and so the ten thousand dollars is yours. Because that—that's the Holy Spirit. Praise somebody, the Lord is right. somebody. I don't know how, because it wasn't on our records. Bought a book and uh, gave it to the nuns, a lady of the angels monastery, monastery at EWTN. Okay, and, now I got to tell that story. Okay. <laughs> so we published the book, and immediately the book is an overnight success. But all the money that we would make from the book, we had to put back into printing another printing because we were selling ten thousand every three weeks. When you lose weeks, that much money, it's just you going can't so be fast. Cool. There's no way. So, Liz Elena had taken over paying the bills because it was too depressing for me. She didn't want him to suffer. And so she, so. Uh, but she was taking out the only good pilgrimage we had in 1986. It was an Hispanic pilgrimage. Speaking. Fifty people from the area that we live in now heading overseas, and so I took over paying the bills. She was Bad overseas. Donato. And I didn't realize that when the electricity was due or when the gas was due or when the phone bill was due, we would wait until we got the final notice, we're turning it off tomorrow, and then run. And hand and carry hand, it. Here's the, here's the, she didn't tell me that. So, so it was time to pay the phone bill, and you know I had the last notice, we're going to turn it off, and I just sent a check. So one, and we were getting orders on our 800 number. That was the only thing, you know, was the little 800 number, getting those oh. orders in. And so one of our volunteers calls us up home and says, they've cut off your phone. Your phone is dead. I said, what? Yes, they say it's disconnected. So Penny calls up the phone company. We hadn't paid the bill. And they really believed it when we said the check is in the mail. It really is in the mail. And so they said, okay, we'll turn the phone back on. It's going to cost you $50. We ran with the $50. But it won't be until 1 o'clock this afternoon. So we're in the office, and everybody's 
giving me really dirty looks. We really weren't. Because we I'm the one so. who did it. I didn't pay the bill the way it was supposed to be paid. It, there was a lot of silence, let's say. That was but very about, quiet. About 12.30, 12 o'clock, Penny says, we had a fish store next door. I'm going next door to get you lunch. What do you want? Okay. <laughs> so she goes out. And all of a sudden, the silence is broken by the sound of the telephone ringing. The phone rings. Yay, we got the phone back. I pick it up. And a little voice on the other end says, this is EWTN. How would you like to come on Mother Angelica's show? <laughs> that was the first call we got when that phone came back on. And, of and, course, and the nun who gave the book to <coughs> Mother is name is Sister Antoinette Dr. Anthony again. So God, our life, every one of us, our life is a puzzle. And there are little pieces that fit in the puzzle that make up the whole frame of our life. We just have to recognize, and it's God working in our life. And he's having a ball doing it. He really is. He has so much fun putting these pieces of the puzzle there, and especially us thinking that we're in charge. And he says to the Blessed Mother, would you believe it? They really think they're doing this. They think they know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. We are all called to sainthood. There is no reason that any of us are alive but to become saints. A young man in a seminary in Guadalajara, Mexico, when I asked him, what are you doing here? You want to become holy? This is the same seminary where 15 martyrs were beatified. Were beatified. Martyrs of persecution in the 1920s. And he looked me right in the eyes, and he blinded me. And he said, I have come here to become a saint. That is the heritage that we want to share with you. We are here, all of us, to become saints. That is the meaning of our life. But now, saints. we know, all of us here, we know, if Jesus were to come today, we're going to the kingdom. We may have a side trip to purgatory, most Please likely, <laughs> but we are going to the kingdom. We're going to heaven. Jesus will triumph. It's scriptural. We know that. He made a promise. But if Jesus were to come today, how many people do you know that would not be coming with us? Brothers or sisters, husbands, wives, uncles, aunts, cousins, friends, friends neighbors. neighbors, anybody. I mean, somebody comes to your mind when I mention that who would not be coming with us to the kingdom if Jesus were to come today. That is your first line of fire. Those are the first people you've got to reach out to and evangelize and bring them back to the church. And how do you do this? Do you go up and stand up on a soapbox and preach? If you can, that's fine. But Juan Diego That'll get was one of the greatest uh, evangelists that we know so of. So far, the number one. I would say number one evangelist was Juan Diego. Because of Juan Diego's testimony after Our Lady appeared to him, eight million people were baptized in seven years. We have never had that kind of success rate in the history of our Pentecost church. Pentecost every single day. And how did he do it? How did Juan Diego, an illiterate Indian, evangelize? The people would come to the little, little chapel, and he swept the floors. He was like the He sacristan. was the sacristan. Three years he did this. And the Indians would come because they heard about this lady who had defeated the sun god and the moon god. And had come to an Indian. See, a lady says, I could send anyone to do my bidding and it would be done, but it has to be you. See, a lady knew that if she were to stop the annihilation of brother against brother and make family, and that's why you're so beautiful, because you are a mixture of two magnificent cultures. She knew she had to send an Indian. She had to appear to an Indian. So they would say, they would ask about what happened here? And he'd say, well, the lady came to this Indian. He would never say it was him. And he would tell the story about how a lady came and how she defeated the sun god and the moon god 
and how she was from heaven. And before he was finished, they were ready to be baptized. So all they had to do was go over to the Franciscans and they were baptized. Eight, what was he? He was a storyteller. Juan Diego all. was a storyteller. A simple storyteller. What do you think we do? We tell stories. That's, we tell stories of the faith. What can you do? You can tell stories. And you who can, can you sing. tell stories to? Stir your grandchildren, hearts, singing. your children, your friends, your neighbors. I mean, there's no limit to who you can reach out and touch. All you have to do is do it. In our ministry, in the mission, there will be a place for people, uh, kids like us. Not everybody can um, use a computer. Not everyone can um, edit videos. Not everyone uh, uh, can do the varied But some jobs. people can bake cookies. But they can bake cookies. Some people they can, can babysit. They can make tortillas. They can tell stories can the way fat. our grandparents yes. did. I learned my heritage, which I am so proud of, from a grandmother. Brother Joseph learned his from the feet of from his grandfather, grandfather, who spoke only German. Luz Elena, you know, the custom was to send a girl to stay with grandma so she wasn't alone till she got to the age where boys were interested and then she had to go back to mama. Luz Elena, from the time she was a little one. She was in Tepatitlan in Jalisco and with her, her grandmother. grandmother her grand they, they said the, uh, in the morning, the afternoon, at night, they said the Angelus. Every feast day she was dressed up, which is the custom there, in little peasant dresses. And she would lead the Angelus, a little child. They said the rosary. She was brought up. It's no accident that Luz Elena is a dedicated lay sister today. It's because of her grandmother. Grandparents are powerful. You got a lot of power, Grandpa. You just have to use it. Okay, so uh, when they let you babysit the kids, you oh know yeah. what to do, right? You oh know what yeah. to do. Oh yeah. Do you know that when my grandson, now he's 31, when he was a baby, uh, he would cry. You know, he had, he had colic, and he actually was allergic to milk. And uh, I was the only one. I would walk with him, you know, and I'd walk. Uh, and just rocking him like this, and I would be talking to him, just like I'm talking to you, and my daughter would say, there goes the fool again. He doesn't understand what she's saying. Wow. The first one he called was me, and he called me Baba, because he couldn't say Mama. Until today, we are inseparable. Don't let anybody kid you. You have another chance. A second chance. Though we have the most precious treasures in this next generation, and that's what the Pope, and you, you young people, the Pope did not say that you are the generation of to the come. future. You're the now you generation. The church You're now. of today. One of the reasons that the young are so attracted to Pope John Paul II is because he recognizes the youth as being a world culture of today, not the future of the church, but the present of the church, what we need today in the church. You have a voice in the church today, and you better make yourself known. We're gonna have to, we gotta leave here in 25 minutes, okay. and we have to I sign some books. I just wanna leave books. you with a word. Right, we gotta leave at 1230. This, this is a holy place where you live. Much bloodshed, much hopes, much sorrows, Many mistakes and many joys happened here. You have the patronage of one of the greatest. Please study about St. Anthony so that you know it was no Got to know. So we have a video on St. Anthony. He's oh. dynamite. He, uh, you do, you have money. no idea the scope of St. Anthony. He's a doctor of the church. Please be proud of where you live. Protect where you live. Be proud of your church. Defend your church. Take care of your family. This is the attacks. The attacks by the enemy is, to, is on the families. Don't let it happen. Never give up on your kids. Listen, all of us have a cross that nobody else knows. If you looked in my closet, you don't want it. You never give up to, on your children. They're your children forever. You never give up on your family, your husbands, your wives, your 
your brothers, your sisters. There is nothing they can do in this world yeah, that would separate you from them. Let's do a big close then. Can we do our song? No, no. Go the no, song we could do. No, we don't have oh, time. Oh, don't we cheat them. Just no the time. song. Should we do? Should we'll, we'll eat faster. Hurry up, Brother Joseph. Brother Joseph, get, yeah, get the song. She drives me crazy. Now, teach her the song. I do this on pilgrimage together with a poor man. The, the only reason up. is we, we have to go somewhere, and we have to leave at 12.30 to go wherever it is. We're, at 12.30? Oh, okay. It's 10 after 12 now. All right, all right. We're just going to And we have some. to sign books yeah, until yeah. okay. 12.30 or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Tell, tell her. Tell her. Everybody stand up. Father Phil. Come on, help us. Come on, come on. He's got a beautiful voice. He's Irish. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> He's really Mexican. We have seen and we believe your faith with everyone. We have seen and we believe we would share our faith with everyone. You know them by their fruit. You know. Joyful.